Welcome. I am the Reverend Nan Adams, pastor of Providence Presbyterian Church here in Montgomery, Alabama. We're delighted that you have joined us for worship here in person as well as online. I am joined in worship leadership today by Beth Nicholson, our director of music, and Lauren Monte, our accompanist. Please note, of course, we are live streaming right now, but you'll be able to see this service and several others on our website, which is www.providenceprez.live. Once again, I mentioned our COVID protocols. We indeed still have a surging condition here in the state of Alabama, so we're asking all of those, if you are vaccinated or not vaccinated, to please mask while you're inside the building. Something that we've been not remembering to do, it's in your prayer list usually, but I wanted to make sure we began to talk about it in worship on Sunday mornings, and that's the food ministry that continues to happen here at Providence during all this time. It has never stopped since we quit worshiping way back when, in uh, February or March of 2020, and we've continued it every, every week since by making meals for those of us in the congregation and friends of those who are in our congregation, a meal every Wednesday gets delivered to them. And uh, that list changes as the needs change and, and people, we learn about people and folks change their situations and they don't need it anymore. But this past week they did 39 of those kinds of meals and also created 104 master's meals. The Makoa has asked us to step up, ramp up our production of master's meals, and so we are meeting that challenge. So if you are interested in finding out more about that particular ministry, you can speak to Joe Nicholson at any time. Just to let you know, we are not having a third Sunday meal next Sunday. We're kind of taking this month by month and seeing how, how the situation changes, but we've decided that eating together in mass is still probably not a great idea. So we will not be having one of those this, this coming this month. Another announcement that did not make our prayers and concerns list, Willie Sears is having surgery tomorrow at Baptist East. He is still having issues with his kidneys. So please keep Willie in your prayers for tomorrow. If there are any prayer requests or more information you wish to pass on, please feel free to contact me directly at 850-218-9252. Let us worship God.
ourselves to worship. Oh, look at the heavens. They are shouting the glory of God. Their voice goes through all the earth, and their words reach the ends of the world. Let us pray. Let our, let our words of praise be acceptable to you, Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Now let us pray. O gracious and holy God, give us diligence to seek you, wisdom to perceive you, and patience to wait for you. Grant us, O God, a mind to meditate on you, eyes to behold you, ears to listen for your word, a heart to love you, and a life to proclaim you through the power of the Spirit of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us declare those things that we have said and done that have separated us from God and from each other, that we may experience God's mercy and forgiveness. Please join me in a time of confession for humanity, followed by a time of personal confession. You have called us, O God, and we have refused to listen. You have stretched out your hand, and we have not taken it. We have refused to be tamed by your wisdom. Forgive our inability to recognize you and live out the reality of your gospel. Give us the insight we need to understand your place in our lives, so that our words and actions reflect the glory of God and the lives of others. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. The Lord is a very present help to those who seek to follow in the way of divine things. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. to have you with us, and we hope that God's blessings are fulfilled in your own ideas, and your own ways of living, whether we ever get to see you in person or not. Preparing to hear God's word. Will you join me in prayer for illumination? 
O oh God, by your spoken word, you created everything that is. By your incarnate word, you redeemed us. By your comforting word, you are with us still. Prepare us now to hear your word to us this day. Our first lesson is from James chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. Please listen for the word of the Lord. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers and sisters, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. <laughs> For all of us make many mistakes, and anyone who makes no mistakes in speaking is perfect, able to keep the whole body in check with a bridle. But if we put, if we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we guide their whole bodies. Or look at ships, though they are so large that it takes strong winds to drive them, yet they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire, and the tongue is a fire. The tongue is placed among our members as a world of iniquity. It stains the whole body, sets on fire the cycle of nature, and is itself set on fire by hell. For every species of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by the human species, but no one can tame the tongue, a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it, we bless the Lord and Father, and with it, we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and brackish water? Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, yield olives or a grapevine figs? No more can salt water yield fresh. This is the word of the Lord. Thank, Thank you, God. Thank you. Thank you. 
Our second lesson today comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 22, reading verses 1 through 14. Let us listen together for the word of God. After these things, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. God said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I shall show you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. He cut the wood for the burnt offering and set out and went to the place in the distance that God had shown him. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place far away. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. Isaac said to his father Abraham, Father! And he said, Here I am, my son. He said, The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. When they came to the place that God had shown him, Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to kill his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. The angel said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And it said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Doing something a little differently today. I struggled this week with trying to decide what to preach on the anniversary of 9-11, or very, very close to it. And I did a lot of research and a lot of reading and a lot of praying, and I kept coming back to something that I had read earlier in the week, and I decided that it was something that I wanted you all to hear. It just keeps coming back to me as something that I desperately need to hear deep in my heart. So I'm going to ask you to perhaps close your eyes, or perhaps not look at me, because I'm going to be reading the words of Rabbi <clears throat> excuse me, Jonathan Miller. Some of you may know him as the <clears throat> ex, if you will, Rabbi Emmanuel, uh, um, what do you call it, emeritus of Temple Emmanuel in Birmingham, Alabama. He served there from 1991 until he retired 27 years later in June of 2017. But he was the guest speaker, if you will, at this past week's Rosh Hashanah service in Birmingham. So these are his words. Let us tell the story this way. The father is called upon to do the unimaginable. He wakes up in the morning challenged <clears throat> excuse me, by the divine authority to demonstrate his faith. He is determined to perform the ultimate sacrifice. Early in the morning, he saddles his donkey, packs up for his journey, rouses the longed-for son, longed son of his old age, and together with their servants, they set out on a three-day journey to somewhere unknown. He stops at the foot of the mountain steals himself for the hike to the peak. Father and son ascend together. 
Few words pass between them. The father dreads what will happen, but faith is a strange force that can impel people to do the outrageous in the name of a higher cause. On top of the mountain, the pair construct an altar. The father, overcome with zeal, grabs his son and in a whirl of activity, ties his unsuspecting boy to the altar and raises the sacrificial knife for the slaughter. In the nick of time, an angel cries out and says, No, don't do it. You have proved yourself. A ram appears miraculously, caught in a thicket by his chauffeur. The ram is given to satisfy the father's faith, and the father descends from the mountaintop and journeys to bear Shiva to decompress and to process what happened. Now in Hebron, just down the road, he buries his beloved wife, who unexpectedly died midlife at the age of 127, while he was faith testing on the mountaintop. The husband grieved for his wife, and he, the father, could not find his son. He scoured Canaan with an amber alert. And when he will find him, what exactly will he say after so much has happened? Let's tell the story this way. The boy is roused up early in the morning with sleep still in his eyes. Father placed him on a donkey and off they go on an adventure. Father is strangely out of sorts, quiet, deep in thought. When they arrive at their destination, some mountain, father gets off his animal and the two of them head up to the hilltop carrying wood, a knife, and a flint for sacrifice. The boy thinks, we have no offering with us. Maybe Papa has something prepared up top. The boy helps the father build the altar. Nobody talks. Suddenly the boy finds himself tied up and carried onto the bed of sticks. The father looks through him, seeing something, but not the boy. The boy cannot look. Or imagine what might come. The father grabs the knife, raises his hand, and suddenly stops his hand in midair. He fetches a bleeding ram and wordlessly slaughters the ram and burns it whole. When the animal is consumed by fire, the father heads down the mountain. The boy wriggles free from the ties that bind, bound him tight, fearful, uncomprehending, dazed. He finds his way down the mountain. Nobody is there for him. He makes his way back to nowhere. Only later did he learn that his mother had died. He didn't get a chance to say goodbye or even attend the burial. He was lost in the aftermath of the traumatic moments on the mountaintop. He is still lost. He feels that he is on his own, always and ever on his own. My friends, here is the question. Which of these stories is true? Which of these stories reflect what truly happened on that faithful journey on the summit and in the aftermath? It is a matter of perspective, isn't it? For Father Abraham, he showed his willingness to give and give and give until he would give everything and there was nothing left to give. For son Isaac, he showed his willingness to trust and trust and trust. And even though he escaped with his life, he never healed from that trauma. So which is true? Which is the true tale of what happened during those three fate-filled days? Picture Abraham on the psychiatrist's couch at Beersheba. As he opens up and tells his story, he is speaking his truth. He was not some psychotic child murderer. He was and remains a good man. 
He is a man of faith, a model for three future religions. He did what he felt compelled to do because he based his life on trusting God and hearkening to God's command. And Abraham was not betrayed. This was a test. It was the toughest test imaginable. He passed it. He passed it without joy or happiness or jubilation, but he passed it. And other people of faith in the centuries to follow would look for him, for his steadfastness, for his trust, and they, they will pass their tests when life challenges them and the world will be better. Yes, it will be better, and they will rejoice. And faith does not make you happy, and tests are never placed in front of us because we enjoy them, and the challenges of life suck, to be honest. But look, a man of faith, of true faith, really has no choice, does he? It hurts him that he doesn't talk very much to Isaac. Really, Doc, what can I possibly say to him to help him understand? Picture Isaac <clears throat> on another psychiatrist's couch. As he opens up and tells his story, he relives, relives the little boy's excitement of going on a journey. The horror, then, he felt at the moment of almost death. Decades later, he still cannot sleep a night without waking up in terror. His life has been a daze ever since. Isaac grew up fast. He, he learned to take care of himself pretty quick on. He learned what it was like to be betrayed and live with silence. Of course, compounding his loss, his mother died at the end of their journey. He had to learn to make it through his years without the love of his mother and with an abiding fear of his father. Still, he admired his dad. His father's ideals are his and his father's faith. It's his faith too. The promises God made to his father on the mountaintop are now the promises that come to him. He endured his experience on the mountain summit and he lives with it. And it never made any sense to him. And it still hurts like hell. But cheapers, life can hurt a lot of people. I suppose that if you are not hurting some, you must be dead, says Isaac to the psychiatrist. So which story is true? Here is the answer. They are both true. Abraham understands his role and was grateful that his son was spared from his hand. Isaac faced death at the head, hands of his beloved father, whom he had trusted with his life. Both stories are true. Both stories reverberate in us and through us this Rosh Hashanah, this Jewish New Year. My dear friends, as we greet the New Year, 5782 in the Jewish calendar, and put the old one behind us, we can all benefit from some time on the psychiatrist's couch. Good God, how on earth did we get here at this moment? It is all a matter of perspective, isn't it? How on earth, like Isaac and Abraham before us, do we live with people whose understanding of reality is so different from ours? In our nation, half of our compatriots wakes up with one reality. The other half wakes up living in a seemingly different universe. In 2021, Democrats are convinced that Republicans are a clear and present danger to our country. And Republicans assert that Democrats plot to run our country into the ground. The talking head pundits who, well, they just like to lob water balloons at each other, but we're the ones that get wet. Thanksgiving, satyrs, family celebrations are now fraught with tension. Because of the rebellious child or the crazy uncle who bring their arguments to the family table. It's all a matter of perspective, isn't it? In my lifetime, I've never seen our people, the Jewish people, as riven by our differences so pronounced 
and attenuated. The entire world seems to have gone crazy. And I feel that we are all expending energy hollering at people among whom we are destined to live, upon whom we depend, <clears throat> excuse me, members of our own families, our metaphorical and our biological families, who see us as Moshe, absolutely divorced from reality. No matter where a Jew stands on religious matters, our Israeli politics, our institutional loyalty, we pillory people with different points of view from our own. And the trend line seems to be getting worse. The Jewish catchphrase of the 1980s, we are one, has been replaced by, you're an idiot. <laughs> or worse, you are my villainous adversary and I have to crush you. King Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes, and I am not going to butcher the Hebrew here, but it translates, all of the words are depleting. A person can never say enough. We are tired and we are weary from all these battles which swirl around us with no let up. It becomes too much. Too much. Too much. And when we enter the arena, no one seems to emerge victorious. Still, we battle on, ever depleted, rooting for our side and cursing our neighbors. Well, today I want to offer you a soul cure, a strategy for the terrible state of dialogue that we are suffering through. The cure is counterintuitive. Better than sharpening the tongue of the Twitter handle, there might be more effective ways to respond than by ramping up the argument and raising the stakes. Marking the people we disagree with as odious and beyond the pale. By definition, we disagree with these people who see things differently from us and who understand and care about these same issues and know that we have a completely different lens to look at them. I made my living through words, but oddly enough, I have found that I am rarely able to convince through my words. When we encounter people who differ from us, whose understanding of reality makes us wince. We are better able to engage with them and master ourselves when we talk less and listen more. An open heart can change others more readily than a quick tongue or a belittling retort. And most important, it keeps us focused on the humanity of every human being, including the ones sitting across the table. Here's my prescription for living in comedy during these difficult, divided times. Endeavor to understand more than to defend. To seek more than to proclaim. Too often we go straight to our talking points and lose the ability to see the other as a full human being, just like us. Understanding is better than proclamations, because when a person is first understood, they are more open to hearing from others. Engaging with our fellow human beings is more than point, counterpoint. <clears throat> Engaging is searching heart to heart. And the way to the heart is through the ears and the smile and the touch. As we struggled through the past several years, we should have all learned that the way to transform people is not to shout down at them or belittle them. The way to transform people is to love them <laughs> as best we can, to respect them and to understand them. We do not all have to agree to be in community. But 
but we do have to understand. The joining of hearts is always more enduring than the meeting of minds. It would have been so simple, so understandable for the Jewish endeavor, our eternal creator covenant with God, to crumble right there on the mountaintop. The nations expected Abraham to say no to God so he would not face this awful test. And Isaac had ample grants to separate from his father, Abraham, and say to the future, (laughs) I want nothing to do with my father or my father's God. It would have been so understandable for father and son and the divine power to shut each other down, to close themselves off from each other, to walk away. But the Torah tells us that Abraham and Isaac, as befuddled and hurt and misunderstood as they were, did not walk away from each other. The Torah tells us, the Hebrew translates, the two of them walked together. And we find that in our own First Testament. Abraham and Isaac did not experience their test in the same way. They both suffered for their faith and for the eternal covenant that bound them and their progeny to God. But still the two of them walked together. Friends, the students of Scripture know that the Torah rarely repeats itself. Unlike the words of politicians or preachers, there are no superfluous words in our scriptures. So it is surprising, jarring even, that twice the Torah mentions these same set of words in Hebrew. In this one chapter, the two of them walked together. Rakhlu Sharha Yachdav. The two of them walked together. Abraham and Isaac, father and son, with their different hopes and disappointments, sorrows and betrayals, their tears and their loneliness and their grief. The two of them walked together. Somehow they managed to walk together. And that is why we are still here today to greet the new year, 5782. As Jews scattered around the world, And as Americans and a nation tearing itself apart at the seams, we should take instruction from Abraham and Isaac, from father and son. Walk together. Our common destiny depends upon our understanding and our readiness to hearken to others who do not see what we see. Even those whom we find challenging. And to extend an open heart and a willing ear. Oh, these days it is hard to walk together with people so very different from us. But together, we must walk. If we are to engage in the promise and the hopes and the dreams our ancestors have put before us, it's so hard to do. But if we are to arrive at a new mountaintop, There is no other way forward. In our Jewish liturgy, when we conclude our most crucial prayers, we are given a moment to pray and reflect silently by ourselves, to enter our own inner world, and to make sure that we are centered. Our our liturgy has us focus on our own behavior and our own attitudes. Our prayers are not answered when we speak the loudest. Our prayers are answered when we speak with kindness and gentleness. We conclude our silent prayer with these beautiful words. My God, guard my speech from evil and my lips from deception. Before those who slander me, I will hold my tongue. I will practice humility. Open my heart to your Torah that I may pursue your mitzvah. 
As for all who think evil of me, cancel their designs and frustrate their schemes. Act for your own sake, for the sake of your power, for the sake of your holiness, for the sake of your Torah, so that your loved ones may be rescued. Save with your power and answer me. This new year, God, save us with your power and answer us. My friends, may it be so for you and for me. Amen. I ask all who are able to stand and say what we believe using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Let us prepare our hearts and minds for prayer. Indeed, God, we have gathered this day with many reflections of yesterday's events, not only in our own nation, but from others around the world. We still grieve that tragedy. So you, eternal God, are our only hope our help in times of trouble. So you show nations ways to work out differences. Do not let threats multiply or power be used without compassion. May your will overrule human willfulness so that people may agree and settle claims peacefully. Hold back those who are impulsive, O God, lest desire for vengeance overwhelm our common welfare. Bring peace to earth through Jesus Christ our Lord, the Prince of Peace and Savior savior of us all. And now, Lord, we pray for our own wisdom that we can communicate effectively with love Shalom and compassion. Strive to live in connectedness and understanding. We pray for courage so that we can live out our faith, giving witness with our words and actions that you are the Messiah. We pray for the will to take up the cross and to follow wherever you may lead. And we pray for love. You're loving us so that we can live with the intentionality to know each other by name and have the deep relationships that you want us to have with you and with each other. Through the interweaving of our dreams, strengthened as they are with threads of beauty, goodness, and truth, the glory we may become is woven into reality. May we ever offer our hearts to this essential devotion. So by the power of your spirit, we make our prayer with resurrection hope. And join in saying the prayer Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. 
Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. The kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of that Spirit be with you this day and forevermore. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen.